Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's great to be with you this morning, and I will uh, put my invitation to Pastor Bill's invitation to turn up on the 17th of January at his place for coffee and cake. If coming to see me wasn't enough, we are going to have coffee and cake that you can come and have as well. So, um, so please come if you're a supporter, but if you're not and you're really interested in what we're doing, you want to see some photos and hear some stories, love you to come uh, on the 17th of January at 7 o'clock. But just a big thank you to the church and to Pastor Bill. Love being here, love this place and um, grew up here, um, but just really appreciate the church and your prayers and your faithfulness and just all that you do for missions. It's not just us, it's a hope of other people that do missions out of this place as well and your heart to pioneer down south as well. It's just uh, outstanding. So God bless you and just a big um, thank you for that. Uh, also, you missed one steal. I think my sister is here, Naomi. Naomi, you're over there as well. So hi to Naomi and her husband, Joel. And um, their little Hannah as well. So we've got four generations um, here this morning. So with my grandmother, mother, and Naomi and her little baby. So that's exciting. Eh? So big hello. Yeah, do you want to give us a wave, Naomi? She's over there. So yeah, good to have my sister here and her, her um, awesome husband as well. So not forgetting you, Joel. So have to keep the family peace. Hallelujah. Um. Oh, and the in-laws. Sorry. Now I'm in real trouble. My mother-in-law and father-in-law are here as well, sitting down the front. So it's great to have them here as well. Um. Anybody else I've missed, Sandra? I need to go to have Cass here, Bill, Nathan. Um, we'll go around the room, will we? Or... <laughs> Uh, great that you are here. It wouldn't be the same if you weren't here this morning. So give the person next to you a big smile and tell them it's great to have you here. Yeah, come on. Love church. Church is meant to be fun. Uh, it's great to be in church today, worshipping Jesus together and uh, leading up to Christmas. So this morning I have a Christmas message for you. And... Um, we're looking, going to look at the story in Matthew chapter 2, uh, verses 1 to, to 8 is where it comes from. We're going to specifically look at verse 1 to 3, and I'll tell you the rest of it in a couple of other verses. But in this story, we see two dramatically different responses to the exact same event. So exact same circumstances, exact same situations, but two massively different responses. And I have three kids, and I know in our life, and even with Sandra and I, same situations, same circumstances are happening, and we can see massively different responses to the exact same situation. Um, so if I said to James, do you want to go bungee jumping, um, that would strike fear, terror, and no chance. Or if I said that to Benjamin, he'd be going, yeah, let's do it, be awesome. Um, so different circumstances, different situations, we all respond differently, don't we? If I, um, if I said oysters to you, um, some of you will be going, why would you bother? Why would you waste your money? Um, but for me, I just, I love oysters, they're awesome. Um, others, if I said gardening, some of you go, yeah, I love gardening. Others of you are going to go, man, I'd touch a tree and it dies. You've got the gift of Jesus and the fig tree gift, don't you? <laughs> Speak a word, you see the tree and it dies. Um, so, different situations, different circumstances, even this Christmas. For some of you, Christmas and you just, it is fantastic for you. Family, family time, everything that happens around Christmas and you're just thinking, amazing and awesome. But others, Christmas can be uh, difficult can be a struggle. How are we going to financially get all the money we need for, to give the kids that we want to give, the gifts that we want to give the kids? Uh, sometimes it can be terrible uh, difficulties with family tensions or loss, loved ones that have gone to be with the Lord or all sorts of things. So Christmas in itself can be great joy and also can be a, a stressful time for some. If I said Steve Smith um, and 220... Um, many of you, well, we will clap, yes. Um, so all those who watched it yesterday, we were there cheering along, um, watching him break history and do all these sorts of things, absolutely amazing. Um, but I'm sure England is not having the same response that we are having to his um, 220 and not out and still going to bat today. Um, 
So a very different response. Even last week, Donald Trump's decision and their declarations he's made about Israel and moving their embassy, we've seen the world respond one way and a whole heap of group of other people respond another way. I'm not going to make any political statement around that, but just you see the difference in those responses. And we're going to have a look at this story where two radically different responses to the exact same events and situations. So Matthew's Gospel, before we read Matthew, let's just, let me just say a couple of things about Matthew's Gospel. The writer Matthew is writing to the Jews. He's specifically wanting to highlight um, four big themes. One is that the Christ, this baby Jesus, was a king, that he was a Messiah. He wanted to talk about the kingdom of God, and he wanted to give the teachings and how to live in this new kingdom. So that's Matthew's perspective. So when we get that, it just puts a bit of a reflection on what we are reading. He's writing to the Jews, the people who understood the customs and the traditions of the time. All the prophecies that were in the Old Testament, they got them all. They knew them. For us, we've got to go back and research it and understand it to get the full picture. But the people he was writing to, they got it straight away. So let's look at Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, there was a time, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem. And they asked, Where is the one who is born King of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. So these people from the east have seen a star and they've heard of this one king of the Jews, and they want to come and worship. So their response to the birth of Jesus is, we want to worship. They seek him out, they searched, they found him, and they worshipped him. Verse 3, King Herod heard this, and he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. Man, two different responses. The wise men, they worship. Herod's disturbed. We see later how that disturbed and that fear causes him to go on and cause mass murder. So Herod, in this story, is Herod the Great. Um, He is known for being great, for being an awesome builder of cities. Uh, He rebuilt and lavishly rebuilt the temple in Jerusalem. Um, But though he has got, we call him Herod the Great, there were some severe deficiencies about his character, in his character and in his life. He lived his life full of suspicion, jealousy, insecurity, selfish ambitions, so much so that he had some of his own children killed. He even had one of his wives murdered out of suspicion, selfishness, jealousy, concern. So his response to the birth of Jesus was fear and reaction. And in that story, it goes on, his reaction was, get the, these wise men together, get the religious rulers together, find out where this baby was born, send them to find him, and then come back and report to him, and he will deal with it. And we know the story, that he had hundreds of children between the age of zero and two killed because of his fear He was threatened. He thought he was going to lose control, lose his power, lose his position, lose so much. So his reaction of fear is to react and with devastating consequences. The wise men, they respond with worship. Herod was afraid that he was going to lose control. He was going to lose his throne. He was going to lose power. He completely and totally misunderstood the reason for Christ's coming. Jesus didn't want his throne. He wanted him. He wanted to be the king of his heart. He wanted to be enthroned on Herod's heart. He wanted to be the king of his life. He didn't want his power. He didn't want his position. But Herod didn't see it. Herod couldn't see the big picture. He couldn't see what God was doing in this situation, in this circumstance. And because of his fear and wanting to control, he responds with devastating consequences. Hundreds of mothers lost their kids because he couldn't see the big picture. He couldn't see what God was doing through the birth of this tiny little baby boy. 
Rather than responding with faith and worship, he responded to the situation. He allowed the situation to control him. And how often do we do that? Maybe our responses aren't as drastic as Herod's. But how often do we respond and allow the situations and the circumstances and our fear of what is going on around us to determine our response? Rather than faith and worship, we allow fear to control. We allow fear to cause us to, do to dominate us and to be the driving force behind our responses and our reactions. Rather than responding in faith and act and being proactive, we become reactive, fearful, controlling, and with devastating consequences. And fear, if we allow our life to be lived and controlled by fear, there, it always has devastating consequences. It always brings limitation. It always brings restriction. And being able to say, I'm not going to live by fear. I'm not going to try and control every situation and circumstance around me. And I'm going to allow, I'm going to respond by faith. I'm going to step out in faith and continue to worship even though things around me would suggest that, man, I've got to control this. Maybe it's work in the workplace. Maybe it's with health issues. Um, and we can allow fear and what doctors say or what work people say or wanting to advance in career and other people come in who threaten our position. That's Herod's situation. He was threatened by somebody else coming. He was going to take his position. And we respond to that person as a threat rather than with love and kindness. Jesus Christ wanted Herod. He wanted to be king of his life, wanted to offer him life, peace, joy, and all the fruits of the Holy Spirit. But he missed out on that because he responded with fear. Let me encourage you. Don't allow fear to control you. Don't allow fear to dominate. Learn the lesson of Herod. and Say, I will respond like the wise men. So let's turn our attention to these wise men. These astrologers who came from the east, probably Persia, they were unexpected. They were wealthy, powerful men, but they came to worship a little baby. They were not Jews, they were not the insiders, they were not part of who would be expected to be there. And Matthew makes it really clear at the beginning of his gospel to the Jews who were the insiders. He says to them, look, these outsiders came, these people who were not part of our religion and our custom, they came to worship this baby Jesus. So Jesus came not just for you, but he came for an outsider. He came for those who were not expected to worship. That's good news. Because really, we're all outsiders, aren't we? When we look at our sinfulness, when we look at our attitude, we look at our actions, man, we're outsiders. We don't measure up. We don't live up to what Christ would have for us and what it is in our sin to actually get to heaven is impossible. So we're outsiders, but Jesus came for you. And maybe you feel like a real outsider today. Maybe coming to this place and you just feel like this is so different to what you normally do and you don't feel worthy or good enough or right to be here. Well, let me tell you, you are in the exact right place. This is where you need to be. Whether you've been a Christian for a long time and you just feel like, this is, what is that, why am I here? Or whether you've just come for the very first time, this is where you need to be. Worshipping Jesus. Lifting up this little baby. And if that is you, I'd, I hope that today and in the coming weeks as we celebrate Christmas, that you would be able to fix your eyes on this little baby Jesus Christ. Like these wise men, they seeked out Jesus. They travelled a long distance to find him. He, they, he wasn't where they expected him to be. He wasn't in the king's palace. He wasn't in the place of worship. Uh, he wasn't in the, in the temple. He was in a little house in Bethlehem but they seeked him out and got themselves there so that they could worship him. So if you're on your journey of seeking, continue on it. Find Jesus. Get to his feet. Get to this little baby and get to the cross and man, it'll change your life. So these ones are unexpected. Unexpected worshippers that came. As I travel the world, I've met many people that I would go, Man, that is unexpected. You are an unexpected worshipper. Many years ago when I was, I was in Indonesia, just across the border from Papua New Guinea, Indonesia is a Muslim country, I met this lady and she used to be a Muslim. And she said, Jesus Christ met me in a dream. 
She was asleep one night. She had this dream and she had a vision of Jesus coming to her, revealing himself to her. So she left all her other religion and found a church and now was a spirit-filled um, believer and loving Jesus and our children are in the faith. But she says, Jesus came to me in a dream. Man, that is totally unexpected, isn't it? You think a Muslim is so far away from Jesus. But Jesus turned up to them in a dream. Unexpected, but now they are worshipping Jesus. We'll have a look at a couple of photos of some other unexpected worshippers. Which one have we got first? We've got this one. Unfortunately, you can't see their face, but this is uh, three uh, older people. And this photo was taken in September this year. Uh, we're on the top floor of a five-story building where we run our Bible school in um, West Bengal in India. And... Um, these three had come from a, a town where we'd planted a church earlier in the year and uh, we set, rented a house, sent a team down and they'd started to do outreach. These three had come to faith in Jesus Christ, coming out of a Hindu background, now getting baptised, our first converts from, from that town. It's a place called Naxalbari, which is right on the Nepal border, Nepal-India border. Um, but they've come to faith and they want to express that in baptism. So unexpected but they're worshipping Jesus, giving their life to him. Hallelujah. Let's have a look at the next photo. This photo is from Assam in India as well, just below China. Um, and these three ladies come, from, come to our church and they've been coming for a while, but earlier this year, in about February, March, they um, faced some severe persecution at the tea plantation where they live and work. And so they're all tea plantation pickers, um, come to Christ. But because of their faith... Um, other groups on the, the compound uh, didn't like them coming to faith, didn't like them believing in Jesus Christ, so they were persecuted. Um, the men ran away thinking and hoping that they wouldn't touch the ladies, but they belted the ladies and the children and burnt down their homes. Um, but they still turned up to church to worship. They didn't allow situations and circumstances to control their worship. Unexpected worshippers. Hallelujah. Seema, who's the one in the yellow, um, she's one of our pastor's wives, and she loves Jesus Christ, but she is the first Christian as far back as she can find in her family, Hindu family. But she's come out of that, come into faith. I've met her parents, they love her, they love their grandkid, but they've got a different religion. But she said, I'm coming to Christ, I'm going to worship him, even though it caused her a fair bit of struggle with her family initially. But unexpected worshippers. All around the world, there's people who are unexpected worshippers. And you'll look at me and you'll say, well, you're an expected worshipper. Because, well, we know your mum and dad and they're awesome. Um, I, anyway, they, they're awesome and they're pastors and they love Jesus. And in fact, my grandmother who's here, she loves Jesus. And uh, my, mom, my dad's mum and dad love Jesus. And my great-grandmother who I got to meet loved Jesus. And I've, so I have a long history of Christianity in my family. But you know what? That doesn't guarantee that my children are going to love Jesus. I can't take that for granted. So it's even for me to turn up and continue to worship Jesus. That's unexpected, really. Because I know many who have had the exact same background as me um, growing up in church, but are no longer continuing to worship. And as I reflect and look around, I remember some of the people who were here in the youth when we were doing youth, and some of the ones that gave me the biggest headaches, I thought, I don't think you're going to make it long term. But they're still here worshipping. And some of those who were the, the ones down the front doing everything are not here. And I'm thinking, man... Unexpected, but God is so faithful. God is amazing. Hallelujah. So unexpected worshippers. These unexpected worshippers, these ones who we didn't think they would be there. They may not even, shouldn't have even been there, but they're there to worship Jesus. They bought three gifts. And they worshipped Jesus for who he was. Not for what they could get from him. He's just a baby. They can't get anything from him. They're not worshipping to get a benefit, not worshipping to get something back. They're not having faith to get something for their own life. They're worshipping because of who he is. And we're going to have a look at the three gifts that they presented and just see what those gifts show us about who they were worshipping and maybe what they understood or what Matthew wanted us to understand about these gifts. The Jewish readers at the time would have immediately got this. 
They would have understood it straight away and understood exactly what Matthew was saying. Sometimes we read it and we think, oh, not three nice gifts, awesome. Um, but the significance of them, Matthew understood it. The readers of Matthew at that time understood it completely. So the first, oh, let's read Matthew uh, 2 verse 11. So they've left Herod. The star appears over a house and they turn up at that house and Jesus is not in the temple. He's not in the king's palace. This baby is in a little house, not a place where you'd expect to be worshipping a king, but this is where he is and these three wise men, or the wise men, we're not told it's three, but these wise men turn up there. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary and they bowed down and worshipped him. They opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. The gold. Who doesn't like a bit of gold? If I said I had some gold for you today, you'd be all saying, yep, I'll have that. But a bit of gold. Gold for my King Jesus. Gold is the medal of kings. And as soon as they, as they presented him with gold, they are saying, you are a king. Throughout history, as they've dug up tombs and dug up um, the remains of old kings, they've found those bodies, many of those bodies from ancient times, buried with gold. It's the medal of kings. So they are saying by that gift, Jesus is a king. Revelation 17, verse 14, goes on to not tell us that he is just a king, but he is the king of kings. Let's have a... They will wage war against the Lamb. Jesus is also called the Lamb. But the Lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen and faithful followers. Hallelujah. The King of kings wants your worship. The King of kings is worthy of our worship. He is a king. He has authority. He has power. He's above every ruler and authority here on this earth and above earth. He is in that supreme place of authority. And he wants your worship. He wants to be king of your life. Every part of your life. Not just the bit here on Sunday morning. Or the bit that you do at different times. He wants to be king of all of your life. And he is worthy as king to be worshipped. And he wants that place in the throne of your heart to say, I am king of your life. King of my life. I love that passage. That he triumphs. He promises as king to triumph and then to lead you and I into victory. Who doesn't like being on the winning side? Are we cricket? We love being on the Aussies at the moment, don't we? We're on the winning side. But who doesn't love being on the winning side? Jesus Christ has won. He triumphs. He's got a victory. And he promises to lead us into that victory, into that triumph, to overcome difficulties, struggles, pressures, and the problems of life. It's his promise. And as the King of Kings, he takes us there. I love that verse in Revelations as well. It says, well, who's with the King of Kings? Well, those who are with him are those who have been called, chosen, and faithful followers. What a great picture of the King and you and me as those who have been called, chosen, and are faithfully following him. He is worthy of our worship because he is truly King. King above all kings. Let him be King of your life. Put him in the throne. And maybe there's some areas where fear is dominating. Fear is controlling. Put that aside. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who promises to lead us into victory. The second gift that they brought was frankincense or incense. And this is for my Jesus the priest, the great high priest. Incense was a was used for worship in the temple. Throughout the Old Testament and at the time of Jesus, they would have been using incense as for worship. And as I travel around Myanmar and India, you go past the temples there that they're worshipping, there's all this incense and they're burning it and the smells are there and you can know when you're coming to a temple or you're going past a, in the markets, you get the smell of incense coming because you know that oh, that's a place where people buy their incense to, to take to their, the temples to worship. It has a unique smell, but when you smell it, you know that somebody is worshipping. You know, this incense that, that was given was what was used in the temple. They would take that incense and mix it with oil. And then the priest who went in to 
offer the worship and offer the sacrifices on behalf of the people was anointed with that uh, incense, that mixture of oil and incense. And he would go in smelling fantastic, go in with a great smell. Also, they would add that incense into the offerings, to the meat and the animals that were being offered. And it'd be put in with the sacrifice and then offered to give the temple this great smell, this great aroma, that they knew that worship was happening because of the beautiful smell. Well, they gave Jesus this incense, saying, you are a priest, a great high priest. Let's have a look at Hebrews 4. Verse 14, therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. We've got a high priest in heaven. Back in the Old Testament days, um, or even the New Testament days, the, the um, priests would go in to God, into the presence of God, into the temple, into the Holy of Holies to represent the people. The people weren't allowed to go there themselves. They had to go to a priest and he would go and offer, make offerings for them, go and worship for them and do the things on their behalf. So he was really the one who went between the people and God. Now we have a high priest who does that for you and I. My Jesus, a great high priest who now is in heaven, has gone between you and God, has opened up heaven's door for you. So that we have free access into the throne room of grace because Jesus Christ is there speaking to the Father on your behalf. How awesome is that, hey? That picture, that this little, 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 little baby, bitty baby, didn't look like a priest, didn't look like a king, but these wise men recognized it. Matthew wants us to see it, that he was a priest who is going to represent us before God. Hallelujah. So now Jesus is there. You don't have to sacrifice. You don't have to go through rules and regulations and traditions and customs to get to God because you have a high priest who is there for you, representing you there. Hallelujah. Speaking good of you, sharing well of you, t representing you. So when the devil comes and says a whole heap of rubbish in your ear, say, forget about it. My high priest is in heaven. He's dealt with you already. I don't have to listen to your lies and your negativity and your criticism and look at my weaknesses and my downfalls. I'm looking at my high priest who has opened up heaven's door and gives me free access into the throne room of grace. Hallelujah. Yeah. So we've got the gold, we've got the incense, and now we've got the myrrh. Myrrh is a funny gift because really it was a gift of death. So at a baby's at the birth of a baby, they are giving something that represents death. And they're saying, Jesus, you are going to die. Myrrh was used in the embalming process of the body in those days. So Nicodemus, when he went to, took Jesus' body down, he would have brought about um, 100 pounds of myrrh to prepare Jesus' body and embalm it and get it ready for burial. So 100 pounds is about 45 kilo. So that's two 20 kg bags of rice. You probably don't, you probably don't buy 20 kg bags of rice, do you? Sam, no? <laughs> no. But, or a, a 20 kg um, bag of uh, salts for your pool or whatever you buy in bulk, those sorts of things. But it's a lot. It's two of those and a bit extra. It's a lot. But they gave their gift of myrrh. Seeing and identifying for you and for me and the Jewish readers at the time saying this guy, this little baby is born to die. That his death has significance. He will die with significance. He will die for a purpose. It's not an accidental death. It's not just a normal death. That his life has purpose but he is going to die for a purpose. So as Pastor Bill said, Christmas, you can't have Christmas without Easter. You can't have Christmas without looking at the cross, the significance of why the baby was born, and it was to draw us to Easter where he died on a cross for us. Let's have a look at Isaiah 53. The prophet Isaiah, many years before, looked forward and saw the significance of the life of Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, verse 5. But he will be pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. 
and by his wounds we are healed. That that is the purpose, to buy us peace with God, to be our saviour, to set us free from our sin. A punishment that we deserved, he took in our place. We're all sinners. We're all separated from God. We all need our sin problem dealt with. And Jesus Christ was the only one who came and dealt with it once and for all. Hallelujah. What a great promise. This little baby. But these wise men, they saw something. They knew that his death had significance. Do you know the significance of the death of Jesus Christ? So as you celebrate this Christmas, as you look to this little baby and his birth, Remember his death, the significance of him dying on a cross for you and worship him as your saviour, the one who died in your place. So we have gold for a king, incense for the priest and myrrh for the one that would die. The true king, the perfect high priest and the supreme saviour of man. This is the one that we worship. This is the one that the wise men by their gifts are identifying for you and for me. Saying, look at this one. He is worthy of our worship. We'll jump down to verse 12 in Matthew chapter 2. It says this, But when it was time to leave, they went home another way, because God had warned them in a dream not to return to Herod. So they've had a dream, don't go back to Herod, but you're going back another way. You're going back by a different path. You're going back a different way. I've read it from the New Living Translation. That's the NIV up there. Um, but they were warned to go back another way. You know what? When we worship Jesus Christ for who he is, he puts our life on a different path. He puts us on another way. We don't keep going back to the old way. We don't keep going back to the old circumstances and situations. He puts us on a new path. Can I encourage you tonight, today to worship Jesus Christ for who he is because it will put your life on a different path. If we fix ourselves on fears and worries and problems like Herod, we end up back in that old path. Old paths of negative thinking, destructive behaviours, things that just feel like we're going round and round in circles. But getting on the new path, it comes through a path of worshipping Jesus Christ for who he is. My life's on that new path. And I know that I need to continue to worship him because it's easy to allow fears or worries or pressures of life and children and other things to come in Finance, all those sorts of things can come in and take over and we're living in that place and that situation, that circumstance rather than fixing our eyes on Jesus. Hebrews 12 verse 2 tells us to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Let's fix our eyes on Jesus, the king, the priest and the one who is the perfect saviour of mankind and the perfect saviour of your soul. So maybe you're facing some struggles or difficulties or Christmas for you is um, a difficult time. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Focus on him. Choose to worship him. Even in the midst of troubles and circumstances that everyone would say, why would you continue to worship? Maybe your family or your non-believers, why would you continue to worship that God? So I'm not going to let my situations, my circumstances determine my worship. I'm going to allow my worship to determine my path, what happens in my life, because I worship the King of Kings, the Great High Priest and the Saviour of all mankind. Hallelujah. Let's pray together.